welcome to our Bible study this morning. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, we are glad to have you here. Glad to those watching online. Um, we continue uh, our study of the book of Ezra this morning. But to start with, we have our young people who want to share their scripture with us. So we let them do that. Here you go. Hello, my name is Sam. In John 16, verse 33, it says, I have said these things to you, that you may have peace. In your world you have tribulation, tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. I like this verse because I know that no matter what, in what situation, I can trust in God. I see in this verse that I know that no matter what situation, God will help me get through tough times. Please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we need to learn to trust in you in times of need. Help us to look to you. Beca help us to look to you more because we are sinful human beings who need your mercy and grace. Help us to overcome, sa overcome sa Satan and be better humans. Amen. Amen. Hi, my name is Anthony. Isaiah 41.10 says, So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. I like this verse because it makes me feel safe with God. I should not fear anyone because God is by my side. He will up And he will uphold me with his righteous right hand. Please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for being by our side. You protect us when we need it the most. Thank you for forgiving our sins and watching over us through the day while we play sports or just going home. Thank you for watching us and upholding us with your righteous right hand. Amen. Amen. Thank you, boys. Appreciate it. You can give it to one of those ladies there. Very good. Thanks for being here this morning, guys. Okay. Mary. Okay. My name is Mary Marquardt. And I'm just reminding you that um, we're going to have a mic box collection this weekend on Saturday and on Sunday. And um, the next uh, mic box collection will be in December, just so you know. But um, bring your mic boxes or your bags of money or whatever. <laughs> just a little thing. And I wonder if, Jane, did you want to say something about the cards, writing the ca cards uh, for the military. Okay, next week is for writing for the, the cards, uh, Christmas cards for the military. We still need a lot of cards that people could bring in. We got our Christmas cards. And, um, yeah, we'll be doing it from 209. Uh, 209 on the 24th. Correct, right after Bible, after Bible class. class. Okay, uh, thank you. And now I'll turn it over to Carla. <laughs> Good morning. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Carla Augustin, and uh, we are planning on having another bag lunch assembly for the Milwaukee Rescue Mission. The date is uh, Monday, November 4th, and all the uh, donations should be in the kitchen on Sunday, by Sunday, uh, November 3rd. And uh, I will be passing around the sign-up sheet, and please return it to me when you're done. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Here, I'll take, oh yeah, let me just give that to Linda, that's good. <coughs> she needs it next. Okay. I don't know about you, but I really appreciate these young eighth graders coming in and sharing. Uh, they just have so much, there's some really, really good insight that they have in some of those passages. It's just really fun to listen to them. Okay, here we go. Um, this post has been removed because it might cause offense. <laughs> Whatever. Only you can prevent forest choirs. <laughs> uh, and this one I love emergency telephone dial 999 for the Coast Guard police, fire <coughs> or ambulance dial 999 look at the buttons <laughs> there's a button 123 it's all it's on there <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
whatever, you figure it out. <laughs> um, there you go. Sometimes I get desperate to find good humor, so you got to deal with what I come up with. Here we go. Let's pray. Good and gracious God, we thank you, thank you for your blessing upon us each and every day. Uh, as we continue our study of the book of your servant Ezra, uh, guide us in our study that we may hear and mark and inwardly digest your message to us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, we're going to, uh, my goal is to finish the book of Ezra today. And that's uh, two more chapters, chapters 9 and chapters 10 uh, of the book of Ezra. And um, the, um, this is where it really, the, kind of the rubber meets the road, if you will. Ezra is there now. Uh, he's uh, established himself as a leader of the community. And the first major issue that he has to deal with is brought before him. Uh, so let's read chapter 9. Um, the first, oh, five verses or so. After these things had been done, the leaders came to me and said, The people of Israel including the priests and the Levites, have not kept themselves separate from the neighboring peoples with their detestable practices, like those of the Canaanites, Hittites, Perizzites, Jebusites, Ammonites, Moabites, Egyptians, and Amorites. They have taken some of their daughters as wives for themselves and their sons and have mingled the holy race with the peoples around them. And the leaders and officials have led the way in this unfaithfulness. When I heard this, I tore my tunic and cloak, pulled hair from my head and beard, and sat down appalled. Then everyone who trembled at the words of God of the God of Israel gathered around me because of this unfaithfulness of the exiles, and I sat there appalled until the evening sacrifice. Okay, let's go that far. Um, all right. Uh, after these things had been done, that's a, um, a kind of a segue. Uh, it covers about three months worth of work that Ezra is doing to establish himself, uh, to get to know the leaders, both the Jewish leaders and the Persian leaders in the area. Uh, and now he's about to sit down and get to work. And, then, and he deals with a problem that um, today is not an issue, but maybe it ought to be in some cases. The issue is exomy. I don't know if you... Uh, exogamy, that's the word I want. Exogamy, it took me a while to figure that one out. Uh, isn't that an interesting term? Exogamy, that's the intermarriage of uh, mar the marrying someone outside of your group. Uh, and that was the issue for the Jews in Jerusalem uh, at this time. Uh, the major theme was to reject idolatry and its pagan practices. Uh, since not only do they transgress the first commandment, but they strike directly at the heart of the gospel message. Um, Israel had been warned by Moses and the prophets of the danger of marrying heathen people. Someone look up Deuteronomy 7, verses 3 and 4, please. Um, Deuteronomy 7, 3 and 4. Uh, so this is not a new issue, uh, and Ezra is in. He's a, a student of the Torah, uh, and he applies the Torah uh, to their situation. Somebody have Deuteronomy 7? You got it? No. Go ahead and read it. Seven, um, Verses 3 and 4. Do not intermarry with them. Do not give your daughters to their sons or take their daughters for your sons, for they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods, and the Lord's anger will burn against you and will quickly destroy you. Okay. Don't intermarry. Now, is that because the Jews just wanted to be separatists and they don't want to associate with anybody that's not them? Well, that's the way it's often interpreted. But that's not the issue. The issue is how idolatry can corrupt a person, a family, a tribe, a whole nation. And uh, we saw evidence of that throughout the Old Testament. Uh, Solomon was a very wise man except one thing. 
He married a bunch of foreign wives who corrupted him and turned him away from the Lord uh, by the end of his life. There are numerous other examples. The problem is idolatry. Now when we talk about idolatry, we're not talking about um, some of the idols that we have, like I eat too much and, and those kind of things. But this is blatant uh, idolatry and idolatry practices. For example, the uh, gods of the Canaanites, the Baals and so forth, and, and many of the gods that the, the surrounding nations worshipped were basically fertility gods. Baal, the Ashtoreth is the female, they're fertility gods. And how do you worship a fertility god? Figure it out. <laughs> you had um, priests and priestesses for these fertility gods, and they had they, they were cult prostitutes is what they were, and that's how you worship them. Uh, they would do sacrifices, and the sacrifices were usually held done on high places, and you see that term throughout the Old Testament, the high places. That was places of sacrifice to these false gods. And so it took them away from the temple, it took them away from God and to other practices. <clears throat> Even so far as, and a number of the Israelite kings <clears throat> fell victim to this. If you read uh, First and Second uh, Kings, First and Second Chronicles, you see examples of this, where they would actually take their children and sacrifice them. They would burn them to these to these gods. Uh, that was common practice among the uh, false gods. And so, what is at issue here is not not just intermarriage. What's at issue here is that the non-believing spouse, be that male or female, can have the tendency, not always, the tendency to pull you away from the faith that you believe in, the walk that you are making, and go their way. And if that's done enough, then not only is a family diverted, not only is a marriage diverted, but ultimately a whole tribe, a whole nation is diverted, and then the promise of the Messiah is at stake. That's really what he's talking about uh, in the people of Israel, including the priests and the Levites, have not kept themselves separate from the neighboring practices and so forth. And um, verse 2, they have taken some of their daughters as wives and themselves and their sons and have mingled the holy race with peoples around them. The Greek, the Hebrew word is actually the holy seed. Uh, that the, this messianic seed that's it to being traced. That's what's at stake. So this is a major, major issue for the early, uh, for the Jews who have come back to Jerusalem, who are resettled there, and they need to maintain their identity. They need to remain who they are. And if you intermingle this enough, you forget who you are. You forget your culture, your heritage, uh, just, a, just a quick question. How many of your families came from Germany? Raise your hand. How many of you speak German? I took it in school. <laughs> One or two. Do you see what's happened? Inside of two to three generations? What your families grew up with is gone. Now that's not a terrible thing if you don't speak German. I figured out it must not be a difficult language because when I was in Germany, even little kids were speaking it, so it can't be that hard. <laughs> but we've lost that connection. And now, now take that to the people of Israel, to their following of God, to their worship of God and obedience to the Torah, and their faithfulness so that out of that seed comes the Messiah. You see what's at stake? Mm -hmm. That's what's going on here. And that's why uh, Ezra gets pretty upset. They uh, list the various tribes. Uh, intermarriage was, of course, attractive. Uh, it's attractive especially for the upper classes uh, because marriages were arranged not because of love, but because of political and economic connections. 
that's where marriages were arranged. The, the women really had very little say about it. The dad would say, I've been talking to my neighbor over there who has a really nice store, nice shop. I think it would be good if we got married into that and benefited from that economically. Uh, so daughter number one, guess what? You get to marry their son. <coughs> End of discussion. Um, and uh, daughter number one, maybe 16 years old, 14 years old. But that's what's going to happen. As soon as she is physically able to bear children, she got married. Anyhow, that was very, it was a very attractive. But the, um, there is a second theme in chapters 9 and 10. As a, more than just intermarriage, the second theme is repentance. If you are going the wrong direction, then repentance is to turn around. is isn't just saying, I'm sorry. That's not repentance. I, you know, I said I'm sorry when I got caught, you know, by my mom, you know, I'm sorry. And, or she would grab my arm and we, my brother and I would be in a fight and she'd grab my arm and she'd say, tell him you're sorry. <laughs> and I would when the pressure on my arm got so much that I couldn't bear it anymore. So then I would say, I'm sorry. Well, that's not repentance. Repentance means to turn around, to go another direction, to not do that anymore. And that's the second major theme in Ezra 9 and 10. And so the one thing that we see about Ezra uh, is that Ezra was a person, and uh, thank you, um, Nick Nigaman, for giving me this. He handed me this. Uh, Receive the gospel of Christ, it says, whose herald you are. Believe what you read. Teach what you believe. Practice what you teach. Good thought. That was Ezra. Era, Ezra believed what he read. He studied the Torah. He taught what he believed. He taught the Torah to people, but then he practiced it as well. And so now here's the dilemma. They tell, they tell uh, Ezra that there is this huge problem. Um, and some four and a half months after he arrives, he, um, the group approaches Ezra and tells him of this issue. Now, it, it isn't that they just suddenly dawned on them we have a problem. It's probably one of those things where they knew, the leaders knew there was an issue, but had no way to really deal with it. No one was in the position of spiritual and political authority to handle it. Well, Ezra is. He is a teacher of the Torah. He's a rabbi. He is a scribe. He's an appointed by the Persian government, so he can do this. And so they come to Ezra and tell him we have a problem. Um, and they, they list the various peoples. That's not an exhaustive list, but an exemplary list. Canaanites, Hittites, Perizzites, Jebusites, Amorites, Moabites, Egyptians, and Amorites. Um, but um, by the way, for those of you who like to tell ethnic jokes, you can use Hittites. There are no Hittites anymore. They don't exist. So if you want to tell an ethnic joke, let me tell you about two Hittites named Oli and Sven. And <laughs> um, so I'm not the one to come up with that. The sainted Dr. Oswald Hoffman, who was the Lutheran hour speaker, he would tell Hittite jokes on a regular basis. <laughs> he said he had one, one woman came up to him and said, my husband's named Oli and I, he's not Hittite. And I don't like that. <laughs> Anyhow, um, but they've taken some of their daughters as wives for themselves and their sons have mingled the holy race. There's the issue. Um, and, but they didn't have a solution. But notice the impact this had on Ezra. Um, Ezra's reaction was one of grief. Um, grief that is demonstrated physically in a number of ways. He tore his, he tore his tunic which was a, a sign of deep grief. You see other examples of that. Uh, Job, when he lost everything, tore his robes. Um, and the other sign is he pulled out tufts of hair out of his beard and out of his head. And doesn't feel good. But um, And then he sat in silence for hours. Just sat there. Said nothing, did nothing. Um, and long enough that the uh, people kind of got worried and um, 
kind of gathered around him and, and, and wept with him. Uh, and, um, and then he was finally moved when the evening sacrifice came along, which is late afternoon. And he knelt down and he prayed. Prayed for confession, prayed for God's grace. <coughs> this was a, a serious thing. So let's read his prayer from verses 6 down through verse 15 to the end of the chapter. Oh my God, I am too ashamed and disgraced to lift up my face to you, my God, because our sins are higher than our heads and our guilt has reached to the heavens. From the days of our forefathers until now, our guilt has been great. Because of our sins, we and our kings and our priests have been subjected to the sword and captivity, to pillage and humiliation at the hand of foreign kings as it is today. But now, for a brief moment, the Lord our God has been gracious in leaving us a remnant and giving us a firm place in his sanctuary. And so our God gives light to our eyes and a little relief to, in our bondage. Though we are slaves, our God has not deserted us in our bondage. He has shown us kindness in the sight of the kings of Persia and has granted us new life to rebuild the house of our God and repair its ruins. And he has given us a wall of protection in Judah and Jerusalem. But now, O oh our God, what can we say after this? For we have disregarded the commands you gave through your servants, the prophets, when you said, the land you are entering to possess is a land polluted by the corruption of its peoples. By their detestable practices, they have filled it with their impurity from one end to the other. Therefore, do not give your daughters in marriage to their sons or take their daughters for your sons. Do not seek a treaty of friendship with them at any time that you may be strong and eat the good things of the land and leave it to your children as an everlasting inheritance. What has happened to us as a result of our evil deeds and our great guilt, and yet, our God, you have punished us less than our sins have deserved and have given us a remnant like this. Shall we again break your commands and intermarry with the peoples who commit such detestable practices? Would you not be angry enough with us to destroy us, leaving us no remnant or survivor? O Lord, God of Israel, you are righteous. We are left this day as a remnant. Here we are before you in our guilt, though because of it not one of us is can stand in your presence. Okay. Ezra's prayer uh, alternates between confession and uh, acknowledgement of God's grace. Indeed, the only reason he can go to God in prayer and offer his confession is because he knows that God is a God of grace and mercy and forgiveness. The first part of the confession is um, his own guilt, but it's also the guilt of all the people. Um, he acknowledges guilt both personally and corporately. I, too, I am too ashamed and disgraced to lift up my face to you, O oh my God, he says in verse 6, because our sins, notice the plural pronoun, our sins are higher than our heads, and our guilt has reached the heavens. Now you could say that Ezra was... Uh, who did not have to include himself in, to, in this because he wasn't married to, our, to the best of our knowledge at this point. He hadn't taken a wife. Uh, and, and yet he does include because he's part of this nation of Israel. He is one of the people. And it, it governs him as well. And so um, one of their sins is that they, they just simply didn't learn from the past. Our guilt has been great. Because of our sins, we and our kings and our priests have been subjected to the sword and captivity, to pillage and humilia humiliation at the hand of foreign kings as of today. Uh, they have sinned. They know it. They've been punished for it. Past punishments included sword, captivity, plundering, shame. Um, and all of that's true. But having confessed that guilt... Ezra turns to God for his mercy. Verse 8. But now for a brief moment, the Lord our God has been gracious in leaving us a remnant. We should have been destroyed, but we weren't. We have a remnant. We have a firm place in his sanctuary. We were able to build the temple. 
He gives light to our eyes through the Torah and a little relief in our bondage. Uh, so they have uh, given him a, a remnant. And, and he says, and he has given us um, uh, a, a, a peg is really the word he uses. Um, something to hang our, our uh, uh, the um, hopes on. The, the word that's used in there is really a tent peg which stabilizes the tent um, and God has given us this pen. What's the peg? It's his grace. A secure hold that God could enlighten them and enable them to, to move on. And so then the second confession, verse 10, but now, O our, our God, what can we say after this? For we have disregarded the commands you gave through your servants, the prophets, when you said this land you are entering to possess is a land polluted by the corruption of its peoples. By their detestable practices, they have filled it with their impurity from one end to the other. Therefore, do not give your daughters in marriage to their sons or take their daughters as your sons. So he's repeating the command that Moses gave. Don't seek a treaty of friendship with them uh, so that you may be strong and eat the good things of the land and leave it to your children as an inheritance. Um, the problem is that they didn't learn. It's one thing to say, yeah, we're, we failed and we shouldn't do this anymore. But it's another thing to don't do it anymore. Don't do that again. Okay. We, we sinned. We intermarried. We, we went into idolatry. And the story of the Old Testament is the story of idolatry. And God punished them for it. That's why they ended up in exile in Babylon. And, uh, and now they've come back. God's given them a reprieve. So don't do that anymore. Uh, if we who have the, are the recipients of God's grace uh, know that we are forgiven, then let's stop sinning. Uh, Paul deals with that in Romans 5 and 6, where he's, he makes the, the wonderful statement at the end of verse 5, um, so that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Um, where sin increased, grace increased all the more, he said. And there have been people who have read that and said, well, that's really pretty good. You mean I can just keep on sinning and God's grace is just going to keep on coming? To which Paul says in, in uh, chapter 6, he says, no. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? <laughs> How do we do that? We died to sin. How can you live it in any longer? Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? We were buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may walk a new life. We died to sin. We put it aside. It's done. Just as Christ died for us, we died to sin. We can't keep going. And so Ezra is saying basically the same thing to them. You, you've, you've already done this. Don't do it anymore. Um, and so then verse 13, he ends the prayer by simultaneously confessing sin and praising God. God punished us less than we deserve. That's a fascinating statement. God punished them, yes, but less than we deserve. What did they deserve? Annihilation. Annihilation. But he didn't do that. He saved the remnant. He kept them. And so he asked in, in these last few verses of his prayer two rhetorical questions. Should we turn our back on God? The answer, of course, is no. We don't turn our back on God. Um, Shall we again break your commands and intermarry with the peoples who committed such detestable practices? Would you not be angry enough to destroy us? That's the second question. Would God be justified in destroying them? The answer is yes. He would be. So God of Israel, you are right. You are righteous. What the word righteous means here is that God acts correctly. He acts the proper way. Um, and so he, um, God does the, the right thing. He is righteous. 
Uh, he is righteous in his punishment. He is righteous in his forgiveness. And so here we are, basically, he says. We are before you in our guilt. Uh, we can't stand in your presence. Now what do we do? He throws himself on the mercy of God. That's what confession, that's what repentance is. He does not. It's interesting if you look at that prayer. Ezra does not offer excuses. He doesn't say, well, we were few in number and we needed wives and so it was the natural thing to do. He offers no excuses. He doesn't say, well, yeah, we shouldn't have done that, but he doesn't do any of that stuff. He owns the guilt. He admits it. And he throws himself before the mercy of God for forgiveness. That's repentance. Repentance is not saying, well, you know, they made me do it. You know, or my friend Johnny who said when they got caught fighting, he says, well, he hit me back first. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Ezra doesn't offer any excuses. He doesn't, and nor does he kind of set back and say, well, this really isn't my guilt. I didn't do this, but they're terrible people. They did. No, he doesn't do that. He identifies with them, and he confesses the guilt before God. Comments or questions? Yes? Is that section she read the basis for, and it used to be, used to be, the Catholic saying, don't marry anything, anybody other than a Catholic? I don't know that they would base it on that passage. Oh, okay. But it would be a similar concept. Okay. You know, and, and as a pastor down through the years, uh, as I dealt with a lot, a lot of marriages and see people marrying outside their faith, uh, that often would bother me. Not if they were a person of, of another faith, but often they would be marrying someone of no faith. And that's where I would see that often going. If you marry someone of no faith, either you're going to become like them within a couple of years or you will bring them to faith with you, but usually it's the other way around. And that really would be the thing I would be most concerned of. Roger. I had a senior citizen woman one time telling me about her marriage. She grew up as a Norwegian Lutheran and she said, uh, I was ostracized by my family because I was marrying a German Lutheran. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. There is a, um, if any of you who are fans of Cheers that was on TV a long time ago, there was an episode, did you remember this episode? There was an episode where, where um, uh, what's his name? The, Sam, 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 the no, not Sam the bartender. Woody. Woody. Woody confesses that he is um, entering into a mixed marriage. Woody is a Missouri Synod and he's marrying a Wisconsin Lutheran. <laughs> One of the episodes. And it was a real, real dilemma for him. And I was astounded that the writers put that in because there's a whole lot of the, kind of, the, of the population of people watching that that wouldn't understand. But that was the mixed marriage that he was talking about. He was a Missouri Synod and he was marrying a Wisconsin Lutheran. So uh, <laughs> it was a great episode. i got to find that again sometime. <laughs> And they, and, they, and they handled it very good. They weren't disrespectful in the discussion of it. They didn't put it down. It was a real issue for them. And they handled it pretty well, from what I remember. Any other comments? Yes? I just have a question. At the beginning of the chapter 9, right. who are the officials? Are they the Israelites? Yes, they're the Israelite people who, have, who came there in the first uh, uh, exodus, if you will, the first returning. So they've been there for 20, 25 years. And they've lived there for a while, and they're the Jewish leaders. But they didn't have the authority to set the record. Either they didn't have it, or they didn't believe that they had the authority to do it. Okay? But Ezra, with his status, both politically and religiously, his status, he did. And they didn't question that. And they were, they were participating in this uh, idolatry too, weren't they, the leaders? The, some of them may have been. 
but they would have recognized the dilemma if they would follow the Torah they were definitely out of step and so they didn't know how to resolve it so what's the solution let's read chapter 10 read on uh, the first um, oh I don't know the first eight verses or so while Ezra was praying and confessing, weeping, and throwing himself down before the house of God, a large crowd of Israelites, women, men, women, and children, gathered around him. They too wept bitterly. Then Shekaniah, son of Jehiel, one of the descendants of Elam, said to Ezra, we have been unfaithful to our God by marrying foreign women from the peoples around us. Not, but in spite of this, there is still hope for Israel. Now let us make a covenant before our God to send away all these women and their children in accordance with the counsel of my Lord and of those who fear the commands of our God. Let it be done according to the law. Rise up, this matter is in your hands. We will support you, so take courage and do it. All right, let's just stop there. They gather around Ezra. He's weeping. He's praying. They, they're concerned for him. They join in weeping. They know this is a real issue. They know it's a problem, um, but they don't quite know what to do. But then one by the name of Shechaniah, and he's identified in, as part of the original uh, group of returnees uh, with, with Zerubbabel. Uh, so he's one of the leaders of the, of the people. Uh, he said... Um, um, yeah, we've done this. We've been unfaithful. We've married foreign wives. But then he adds, but in spite of this, there is still hope. He sees a way that they can restore this. And he offers the solution. Notice Ezra doesn't come up with the solution. The people do. That's really the mark of a good leader. You may know what needs to be done, but the best solutions are done by the people themselves. And what you do, and, and you just simply fan that flame. You say, yeah, that's a good idea. Let's go. Uh, even though you knew for a long, long way that that's the way to do it. But that's the mark of a good leader. To not do it for them, but to help them do it for themselves. And so Shechaniah says, um, let's take counsel, let's make a covenant before God to send away all these women and their children in accordance with the counsel of my Lord and of those who fear the commands of our God. When he said according to the counsel of my Lord, what he's referring to there is Ezra, not God. Um, but um, So he proposes a new covenant. But verse 4, but Shechaniah didn't have the authority to pull it off. He hands it to Ezra. The matter is in your hands, we'll support you. Well, I've had people say when I had to do difficult things in the parish, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll support you. You know, they're about 20 feet back behind me as they put me up in front to get the flaming darts of, <laughs> of anger from people. But you've been there, Pastor. <laughs> but they said, we'll be behind you. We will support you in this. So let's read on what they did. Verse 5. So Ezra rose up and put the leading priests and Levites and all Israel under oath to do what had been suggested, and they took the oath. Then Ezra withdrew from before the house of God and went to the room of Jehonan, son of Elishab. While he was there, he ate no food and drank no water, because he continued to mourn over the unfaithfulness of the exiles. A proclamation was then issued throughout Judah and Jerusalem for all the exiles to assemble in Jerusalem. Anyone who failed to appear within three days would forfeit all his property in accordance with the decision of the officials and elders and would himself be expelled from the assembly of the exiles. Okay, that's far. So Ezra um, put all the leading priests, Levites, under oath. Take an oath to do what has been suggested, and they all took the oath. Then Ezra steps out of the picture. He backs off. He goes and prays and fasts, which is always a good thing to do, while they work out the details. And they worked out the details of a proclamation uh, to call an assembly, and everyone would gather in Jerusalem within three days, 
And if you didn't come, you forfeited everything. Your property, your position in the community, you were in exile. Literally. Outside the community anymore. And everything you had as part of the community was lost. Uh, and so uh, they put some teeth in this summons. Now, you know, how is everybody going to get there in three days? Well, the people didn't live very far from Jerusalem. They were a day's journey at most in any of the villages around Jerusalem where they were living at this time. Uh, and so <clears throat> that's not an un unreasonable request uh, for them to come and be a part of this uh, assembly. Um, so let's see what happens when they all gather. Verse 17. Or verse 12, I mean. Where, no, I'm, I'm sorry, where are we? Verse 9. Verse 9, there we go. Within the three days, all the men of Judah and Benjamin had gathered in Jerusalem. And on the 20th day of the ninth month, all the people were sitting in the square before the house of God, greatly distressed by the occasion and because of the rain. Then Ezra the priest stood up and said to them, You have been unfaithful. You have married foreign women, adding to Israel's guilt. Now make confession to the Lord, the God of your fathers, and do his will. Separate yourselves from the peoples around you and from your foreign wives. The whole assembly responded with a loud voice, You are right. We must do as you say. But the, there are many people here, and it is the rainy season, so we cannot stand outside. Besides, this matter cannot be taken care of in a day or two because we have sinned greatly in this thing. Let our officials act for the whole assembly. Then let everyone in our towns who has married a foreign woman come at a set time along with the elders and judges of each town until the fierce anger of our God in this matter is turned away from us. Only Jonathan, son of Azahel, and Jezeah, son of Tikva, supported by Mishalam and Shabbatai, the Levite opposed this. Okay, that far. So the people gathered. They gathered trembling, and it's interesting, they're trembling for two reasons. One, because of the fear of the, the, the gravity of the situation, but also because it's December and they're standing in the rain outside. <laughs> so they're trembling, they're cold. <laughs> Ezra puts the problem in front of them, he confronts them with their sin, and offers the solution that is to um, separate yourselves from the peoples around you and from your foreign wives. Doesn't this present now another sin if they're going to divorce? We're going to talk about that. that. That's a very, very good question. Isn't that another sin of divorcing their wives? Hang on a minute. Give me about five minutes and we're going to get there. It's in my discussion. But you're very, you're very much on target. Okay, so they, um, they're standing outside. They said, yeah, you're right. We need to do this. But there's a lot of people here, and this is going to take some while to sort it out. Why don't we go home and let our elders figure it out? And then you can come around to our various communities and get it sorted out. And they all said that's good, and they could get out of the rain. Um, so um, their primary concern was to keep Israel separate and pure from false gods. I find verse 15 interesting, um, and that is that there's always somebody who votes no. <laughs> Did you ever notice that? There's always somebody who votes no. I've had an Irv in my congregation all my ministry. Irv was a member of my first parish. Irv was a great guy. He came from a tremendous family. Irv and his brother Ernie were members, leaders of the church. But any voters meeting and any action that was taken, I don't care what was on the floor, Irv would vote no. <laughs> you know, he would vote no. And, and, and I, so I once I confronted him. I said, why do you always vote no? I know you're in favor of some of these things. Why do you vote no? And he said, well, I know that there's somebody in the congregation doesn't like it, and I'm representing them. <laughs> <laughs> Who would that be? I don't know, but I know someone doesn't like it. <laughs> and so, and, and down through my ministry, I've always had an Irv who felt like they needed to oppose whatever it was being offered. And I found it interesting, I read this, I said, Irv, you're still there. <laughs> this is, 
Uh, I hope that none of his family ever watches this. Because <laughs> he has a tremendous family. He's a wonderful family. <laughs> but that was Irv. Um, but there's here, there's a couple of people who, uh, about four of them that don't like the idea, but they are outvoted uh, by the vast majority. And so they did. Or read uh, 16 down through 16 and 17. So the exiles did as was proposed. Ezra the priest selected men who were family heads, one from each family division, and all of them designated by name. On the first day of the tenth month, they sat down to investigate the cases. And by the first day of the first month, they finished dealing with all the men who had married foreign women. Okay. The exiles did it was proposed. Now, Elaine, you're right, you raise an issue. What about the sixth commandment? Yeah. And if someone have, uh, I'm going to look up Matthew 19, verse 4. The words of Jesus about marriage. They came to Jesus and said, is it all right to get a divorce? And uh, this is what his answer is. Matthew 19, verse 4. Someone have that, please. Anybody? Yes, go ahead. He answered, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And he said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother, and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Okay. God created male and female. He didn't say he created them Jew and Gentile. He didn't say he created them uh, Wisconsinites and Minnesotans or Lutherans and Catholics or whatever else we use to divide people. And he said they are one. So what do you do with that? There are examples of intermarriage throughout Scripture. Uh, Boaz and Ruth, for example. Ruth was a Moabite. And yet Boaz married her, they had a very successful marriage, and out of that comes David. There are other examples of intermarriage in the Old Testament and throughout Scripture where uh, it, it worked. But there's a bigger issue here than uh, just intermarriage. The bigger issue is the worship and obedience to God. The first commandment is first for a reason, because all other commandments fall under that. You shall have no other gods before me, even your spouse. And if your spouse is leading you away from God, your obedience to God is more important than obedience to your spouse. It's a tragic, difficult thing to do. But there are times in our lives when obedience to the first commandment must take precedence over obedience to any of the other commandments. That is probably dramatically told. I noticed that there's a new um, movie on Dietrich Bonhoeffer just coming out. Uh, Angel Productions uh, is just is going to be released, I think, Thanksgiving sometime. But Dietrich Bonhoeffer had a tremendously moral difficulty. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, in case you don't know his story, was a Lutheran pastor who wanted to just be a pastor. Uh, he loved serving people. He loved proclaiming the word of God. He loved being obedient to God. But the longer he, he lived in, in uh, Germany during World War II, the more he saw the evil that, Her that Hitler was doing to his people and to his religion, to his faith. Until finally he was invited to be part of an... He, he was working actually for the, the German equivalent of the CIA, for example. He was a spy uh, serving Hitler. And he finally just couldn't do it anymore. And they invited him to be part of an assassination plot. Now here's his dilemma. Do I obey God knowing that that, that we must do something about this or do we obey the commandment you shall not kill? Which is it? And he finally resolved that, that following the first commandment took precedence over any of the other commandments. <coughs> and he joined the assassination plot, was discovered and was executed a few months before Germany fell. 
Um, it, it is a tremendous story of that dilemma of which commandment do you put ahead of the commandment to follow God. And we face similar issues. We face similar things when people, when we have loyalties that we have with someone else, but that loyalty is put to the test when they want to lead us away from God. <coughs> and there it could even be in a marriage. And I know I have to, at, uh, very reluctantly at times, I've worked in counsel with, with people with, who have been married to an unbelieving spouse. And finally, they get to a point where they can't continue that anymore because it's they're they're being attacked for their faith constantly. Paul deals with that in Corinthians, where he says the best thing if you are if you are yoked to an unbelieving spouse, stay with it if you can. But if they walk away, okay. <coughs> uh, and it's it, so it's always a difficult thing. Uh, and so in this situation, they recognized what was at stake. What was at stake was their identity as the people of God, as his, as his people, the remnant. And so they recognized that there was no other solution than to separate themselves from the abominations of their neighbors, including their wives. I'm sure that this was not an easy thing done. This was traumatic to the core, but it had to be done. In verses 18 down to the end of the chapter, we're given a list of all the names of the, of the leaders of the people, the, the priests first given first, and then the other people who had to divorce foreign wives. We're not going to read all the names, uh, but if you want to total them up, I think it was a hundred and... Um, Let's see here, uh, 113, uh, those who had intermarried. That's not a great number of people in a community of some 30,000 or so, but nonetheless, those are the ones. It took three months for them to investigate the marriages from December 29, 458 to March 27, 457, uh, and they finally got it all done. But that's a, that's a, huge, that's a huge dilemma. Uh, it's a huge difficulty, but they were fa they faced it, and they did what uh, they believe was the right step to take, not because they disrespected the sixth commandment, but because they respected the first commandment more, and that was first. So comments on that? Yes. Interesting commentary in my Bible. Okay. Why were the men commanded to send away their wives and children? Although the measure was extreme intermarriage to pagans was strictly forbidden according to Deuteronomy, and even the priests and Levites had intermarried. This could be compared today to a Christian marrying a devil worshiper. Hmm. Although a severe solution, it only involved 113 of approximately 29,000 families. Yeah. I had not made that comparison of marrying a devil worshiper, but that's that's a pretty good comparison, I guess. You could do that. Yes, Pat. Uh, these women and children that were sent away, we know that the women are dependent on men for everything. <coughs> what, happened, what would happen to them? Where would they go? That would be a, a tough thing. Well, they were formalized, so they would go back to their families. Would to they be accepted? Well, that's, I don't know. Some would, some would not. Uh, it was, that was, I said, this was an extremely traumatic thing. I don't know what happened to them. We're not told. It's not covered. But it would be, uh, most of them I would expect would go back to their, to their families. If their fathers were still alive, they'd go, go back to their fathers. Um, you know, there may have been recompense paid. Um, I don't know how they handled it. They worked out all the details. We're not given the details of how they did it. Uh, but it was done. It was done carefully and in good order. But what that, whatever that means, what about the children? Uh, they would. Ha yeah, that's a good question. The children would. It said, foreign wives and children. So I don't know. Yes, so Some of the women must have taken on their husband's faith. Right. 
So they wouldn't be included in this list? Probably not. You know, as I say, they, they took three months to implement this to work out all the details, and I'm sure all of that was discussed in those three months' time, and then we're not, but we're not given privy to those details. I wish we were. So I wish they would have. Foreign women, but yeah. God didn't hate foreign women. No. Religion. Right. There was the, it was the, the the abominable practices um, that were was the problem. Um, you know, you know the story of Queen Jezebel, for example. That's a classic case. Yes. Uh, if the Jews are still waiting for the Messiah, do they still believe in this holy seed in terms of marriage? Yeah. Uh, well, let me answer it this way: You cannot make any statement that says Jews believe this. Okay, it just can't be. It can't be done. You can't narrow them down, all of them down in one sentence. That just can't be done. Some would say yes, that it's still they're still waiting for that holy seed. The problem is, there is no Jewish person today that can trace their lineage back specifically to any tribe. Uh, most of them would go back to the tribe of Judah because that's the tribe that was in exile in Babylon and then came back and resettled here. The rest of the ten tribes were, were in the Samaritans and others. But there is no Jew today that can say, yeah, I wasn't from the tribe of Benjamin or I was from the tribe of Levi or I was from the tribe of whatever. They, they, they don't have that ability anymore. At least that's what I was told. Um, so, um, in fact, the... A, a, uh, guy that we had touring Israel told me this, and he was a um, Palestinian, actually. But he said the, the promise of the Messiah, he was a member, actually, at, at Redeemer Lutheran Church in Jerusalem, but uh, the, the, uh, he said the prime prophecy of the Messiah can't be fulfilled anymore. Uh, number one, because no one can trace their lineage back specifically to a certain family, to a certain tribe. Number two, they can't be born in poverty because there is no uh, any t there's free health care there, so anyone's having a baby, they're going to get uh, all the health care they need uh, right there. Uh, and thirdly, Bethlehem, there are no Jews living in Bethlehem, period. None. So, <laughs> it ain't going to happen. So, interesting. Yes, Roger. I one uh, Jewish rabbi say that, well, we're no longer looking for a personal Messiah, we're looking for a golden age. Yeah, and that's another interpretation. As I said, some would some would put it that way. Some aren't looking for anything. Um, it depends on on where they are in their own walk, in their faith. Okay. Yes. Is there anything any Jewish people are still considered a remnant, or are they the ones who converted to Christianity? Well, that's interesting. Does that term remnant apply to the Jews today? It does in the broad sense that anyone who comes from the Jewish heritage uh, is part of that original remnant that really resettled here, uh, in, that you know came out of the captivity and, and resettled in Jerusalem and so forth. But um, does, it, does it apply? I've not seen the term applied anymore here. Does it apply to Christians? Not necessarily. Um, it doesn't. It's interesting even to define uh, who is a Jew is an interesting dilemma. Is it someone who is a, a, a Jew by practice, by their faith? Is it someone who lives in Israel? Uh, is it someone who is a, a, their family, has, uh, traces their lineage back to Judaism? Um, or all of the above, or none of the above? It, it's, a, it's really a wide open question. Okay. Having said that, there's some very, very fine Jewish people, and there are there are quite a few, quite a few Jewish Christians. Uh, a Jewish Missouri Synod pastor. Yes, <laughs> I know a good Jewish Missouri Synod pastor. Uh, he's a good friend of my son's, uh, and there and the there's a couple of Jewish groups, ethnic groups. What are, what are the name of those? Do you remember? Uh, pardon. Apple of His Eye Ministries, yes, is, is a Jewish ministry uh, of Christian Jews. They call themselves Messianic Jews because uh, they believe in the Messiah. Uh, well, oh. does, 
Is Jesus a Jew or a Christian? Yes. <laughs> Those are not mutually exclusive terms. Those are not mutually exclusive terms. Good question, but it, it, uh, actually, he would not be labeled a Christian. He's the founder of the Christian community, but um, they weren't given the title Christian until a number of years later. Just like Martin Luther wasn't a Lutheran. <laughs> he hated the title, actually. He hated the term. Okay. Let's close with prayer, and then next week we'll pick up Ezra. Uh, gracious Lord, thank you for being with us today, for guiding us in our study. Uh, we pray that we may always be obedient to your will, and that as we walk in the faith, that we may do so in a way that demonstrates our love for you, our loyalty to your truths, and our, and our lives of witness to others. May we be those people in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great day in the Lord.